and basically you got it how you're how it needs to be done uh doc uh, the you just put in your questions and i will answer whatever you have whether it's dog or cat related or wild animal related it doesn't matter uh the fourth wednesday of the month i always just do one of these for about an hour and i ask whatever questions uh you have so what question do you have for the uh for the cat I made me hope. Now Sean's here, so he, I can now start. Excellent. <laughs> How's everybody doing? This is the fourth Wednesday. Ask me anything. Um, literally, if it has to do with pet behavior, wild animal behavior, anything, I'm willing to answer it. Just throw your questions into the chat, and we'll go from there. Doc Stewart, you can uh, go ahead and put that question that you have for the cat, if you'd like. I am testing out some new new uh, equipment, so bear with me. All right. Now, I do have an announcement while we're waiting for questions. Oh, Thanksgiving dinner. What's okay to feed the dogs? Uh, nothing from the table, basically. Um well, especially Thanksgiving dinner food is tends to be very high in fats and things of that nature. Well, there are some cha increased chances of uh, various types of uh, ailments that do show up in dogs after Thanksgiving dinner because people do have tons of leftovers and they start feeding them. Um, but uh, they don't react the same way to all the food like we do. So I do suggest uh, not feeding them anything from the table and just trying to stick with uh, the regular stuff. If there, if you are going to give them something, uh, it would I prefer something more grilled, or rather than. Uh, but I saw a meme that said things are okay, right? <laughs> so I would, uh, if anything, I'd just stick with straight meat. But I would also avoid meat that's been soaking in the fats and greases, uh, and skinless meats. Um, also, I would avoid feeding them from the table because then they create an association that they that's what where they can get food if they beg and you'll just reinforce the begging situation so instead i would actually feed them from uh from um someplace else and uh or like store the food and then feed them from another location at that point in time now i do have an announcement too i'm going to announce a little bit into this, but I'd like to get some questions uh, into the feed. If anybody has any questions, go ahead, put those in the chat. Uh, somebody did mention that they do have a cat question. Uh, go ahead and let me know about the cat question, and I will be happy to answer that. You can just drop it in the feed. Uh, I have a men pen. Let's see here. I have a men pen with diabetes. Every time I give her a shot, she freaks out at first. Uh, she was okay with, at first she was okay with it, but now she will bite us, squeal, scream, basically. After the shot is over, she acts completely normal, like it didn't even hurt. Um, will this ever change? Um, yes, it can change. Um, but I would actually, uh, so diabetes is also an interesting one. I'm guessing this is the long-term diabetes medication. That's generally what they offer to the uh, animals. I would find a treat that you can associate with the situation. Um, usually with animals, I actually go through an entire desensitizing process when we have to do medical things. Um, with diabetes, of course, we have the issue of over giving them sugars and stuff like that. But there are treats that are more diabetic friendly. Um, you could actually give meats. Meats rather are lower in carbs than you know well, some of the other treats out there. So if you did a grilled meat, um, uh, skinless meat, just kind of, you couldn't possibly give that, and they tend to be very reactive to it. I would check with your vet, that depending on, because it, uh, it all depends on how, where they are at on the diabetes, on the diabetic level. So if they're just taking the long-term drug anyway, then more or less you're just kind of supplementing that uh, situation. But what I would do is I would actually kind of work towards 
the situation with animals like that. I like to do what's called cooperative care um, with anything that's aversive. I always try to create a positive response and link that to the scenario. I will see if I can find a video in any of my things that uh, kind of shows examples of cooperative care. Um, so with the cooperative care, there is a, uh, let's see, hopefully this isn't blasting over. Let's mute that. There we go. And uh, with the cooperative care, there is a, uh, what we would do is we'd actually desensitize them to the process and then slowly give them uh, rewards for doing just little bits of it. For example, here's one where we worked with it. Uh, we actually used what's called a bucket game. And the thing I like about the bucket game is it actually creates a, a focal point for them to focus on rather than the big scary needle. Um, I'm going to show a video of a dog that we act. It's not a needle situation. But it is a uh, situation where we are using medic, we're using fly spray on their ears, and the dog hated the fly spray. Uh, and what the dog hates, it doesn't have to necessarily be. Uh, there we go. Doesn't necessarily have to be. Uh, oh, there it is. There we go. <coughs> um, doesn't have to be necessarily be shots, but we kind of can desensitize them to the whole process in and of itself. So with the bucket game, what I do is they have a bowl of food in front of them. They stare at the food, and every time they stare at it, they get a reward. Um, which with a diabetic dog, that's where we get a little tricky because we have to, we're very limited on what we can feed them. Once again, check with your vet, see if uh, just straight meat might be okay um, in those situations. But basically, we teach them to focus on this instead of the big scary thing that's happening. And then every time they ignore the scary thing and look at the bucket, they also are ended up telling us what they uh, uh, what that they're ready for the big scary thing to happen because we kind of do it consistently enough. So in this little video, let's see if we can show that there. Perfect. So um, in this little video, we are. Basically, this is the fly spray, and the pup sees it, and as, long, as soon as the pup looks at the bucket, we spray the ear, and then we, so the, the, the signal is look at the bucket, and then he gets a little reward. I do believe that there he should have gotten a reward, but we were still working with uh, the owners at that point in time. But basically, every time he looks at the bucket, we do the big scary thing until eventually we get to this point. And now he's more willing to actually receive the uh, fly spray in the tick and flea and tick application, which they're putting on right now. Because normally before the dog would actually bite during this whole process, but now he's just focused on the treats and rewards rather than the big scary thing that's happening on his back. So yes, you can uh, untrain that, but I would. Uh, it's going to take time. It take, you're going to need to focus in on some other object. And turn that into what we call a consent command, in which case the uh, the dog is um, basically the dog is uh, uh, giving you permission to do the thing that, you, that they don't want. That usually goes a lot better. It does take time though, and uh, but yeah, sometimes they might have gotten hurt one time, and then they start squealing and screaming uh, basically the entire time while they have that. Uh, while they're going through the uh, process because maybe most of the time the shot doesn't hurt, but it did that one time. So they freak out and they over exaggerate. So you kind of have to work with that. Um, I have a dog that has been living with us. Let's see here. I have a dog that has been living with us since June. She is six year old rat terrier, blue healer mix. She is great, except she poops on the floor in my mom's bedroom. Uh, she lives with you. She will bark to get out except when she needs to poop. Okay. So, we have an inconsistent situation. So there's a few different things there. Is she in, She is she trapped in that room for a period of time? Um, not a problem. And if you have more questions, hey, I'll uh, be happy to answer uh, any questions regarding that. Um, is that, for, so for, I'm gonna ask Kristen uh, if that dog is actually locked in that room or not. If she's locked in the room, and then she poops, then that might just be she just doesn't think she has time or she hasn't learned a situation. But 
I'll need, uh, she's not locked in the room. So she actually travels to that room. Oh, focus. There we go. Um, she actually travels to that room to go to the bathroom. In which case, there's two things I would do in that situation. She's free to go anywhere in the house. So I would do two things. One, block her off so she can't go to that location because she has learned possibly through, uh, okay, she chooses to poop in that room. So what often happens is we yell at the dogs for pooping in different parts of the house. And because of that punishment, they actually will, um, they will, uh, excuse me. There we go. Um, because of that being punished elsewhere, they find places where they aren't punished and they go there instead to, uh, go to the restroom and because you can't catch them in the act they just learn to do that and you can't really punish them for doing it after the fact because they don't associate that that's what happened which is why they keep going to that location so what i usually advise in that situation is baby gates to make or making the door shut it's the same room every time just shut the door and she's just not allowed to go in there until we train her to go other places and then i would actually work on doing a bell system um with going outside and then also going out with her and rewarding her when she poops outside. Cause it sounds like she knows that urination is done outside, but she hasn't fully figured out that pooping is done inside uh, or outside. So I would uh, start following her outside, rewarding her for pooping outside and also limit her space around the house. She's not allowed to go anywhere that you're not there because that way you also catch her every time she's about to do it. But it sounds like she's been caught other places and they usually pick the place that's furthest away from people and least the least often where they've gotten in trouble while in the act of doing it. So uh, that is what I would probably suggest in that situation. It can go a little longer. I usually like to train bells because while the barking, the barking behavior to go outside is great, it sometimes isn't consistent enough. And it might be a situation where right now with the with, since she is pooping in one spot in the house, that it hasn't fully associated the going outside with all of the that process. So we just need to make it more consistent uh, with regards to that. Um, also, before I go on to the next question, I would like to announce we are doing a holiday sale starting basically now. I was going to do the announcements during this. Uh, any and all training packages that are purchased between now and the end of the year will be 25% off so long as the invoice is paid by the uh, 31st of December. So if anybody would like to get involved with some training, uh, maybe finances were not the, uh, we're holding it back. There is a 25% off all uh, training sessions from now until the end of the year. If you, uh, and also if you want to gift those training sessions, that's also perfectly fine. Um, the gifting of the training sessions, basically what we will do is uh, uh, the bill has to be paid by the end of the month, but you can give that uh, to a to others as well. Uh, just so long as the invoice is paid by the 31st of December, yeah, you can gift it. Like maybe if you have a plan for a puppy later on and you want to gift somebody or you know somebody who's getting a puppy and you want to gift it to them. Uh, so 25% off until the end of the year because then my main goal for that is to help increase uh, the dogs in upstate, dogs and pets staying in the homes, because um, a lot of people do get puppies in the Christmas time, and actually the correlation that uh, there is a myth that those puppies go back to the shelter. Actually, uh, I I was going to write an article about that about four or five years ago. Then I did my research, which is what I'm apt to do, and I found out that that was actually a myth um, when they actually did studies. Christmas puppies actually stay in the house longer because they tend to be more planned um, and they tend to uh, uh, be more cherished, but mainly it's the planning situation. So basically this 25% off helps with the planning process for people uh, so you can get the puppy and the training because what they did find was the number one reason for animals to get sent back to the shelter is a lack of understanding and also a lack of uh, training. So. Let's get back to the questions then, shall we? Let's see. Let's see here. I have a puppy who is 12 weeks old. She struggle, we're struggling with him biting and nipping. We've tried ignoring him, 
but he bites as soon as we give him attention again. Okay, giving him attention again. Uh, he does. He goes straight for our hands. Uh, we've also tried redirecting him with a toy when he goes to bite us, and he chooses our hands over the toy. Any tips? Yes. So, the, it sounds like you're doing most of the things right. One thing is you are also dealing with a three-month-old puppy. It's not going to get it right away. You're going to need to keep being very consistent. Um, but basically, when the puppy plays with the toy, you keep engaging. If the puppy chooses your hand over the toy, you instantly disengage. Once the puppy calms down, then you go back and re-engage. You want to go through this process over and over again. It sounds like you are on that right track. What you might be running into is a timing issue. Um, because the thing is, the puppy is obviously, it's just, it's playing like a puppy plays. And whatever is in its face, that's what it plays with. Because when puppies are playing, their mouths and stuff are in each other's face. That's what they do. So we just need to teach that redirected behavior of this is what you play with. And the play can continue so long as you're playing with this toy. So you have to be very, very quick um, in training i use uh markers so that's what the clicker training and such is clicker training we we click and mark the moment that they did the thing that we want them to do and they can get a reward for that now with play it can be a little tricky because sometimes the re getting the reward will stop play but uh you can still mark and continue play and go good good while they're chewing on that and then as soon as they switch to the hand you want to say nope and that's going to be the marker on the other side. And we're going to do what's called, a, it's called a negative punishment because we're going to disengage because the puppy wants us to play. And we're not weird. The play is there and then it stops. We're taking it away. And it needs to be right at the perfect time. If they get to bite and chew on you for a few seconds and a little a minute or so, they're going to learn that they still get to do the thing that uh, you don't want them to do um this bad behavior and they keep learning that uh, so you just need to be very quick very uh, on top of it um oftentimes the problem in the household can be with children because sometimes kids will go no stop and then but then that to the puppy that's more play so they're being reinforced to continue to do that so it kind of also takes training uh with children and well basically everybody in the house and the puppy you have to stop immediately and you need to mark it uh, uh, uh. And, and you need to mark that uh, that behavior uh, right when it happens, uh, and to let them know that's what whatever you did at that exact moment. That's why this is happening. If you just ignore them, if you just ignore them and never go back to giving them an alternate behavior or asking them what I would like to do, actually in those situations, ask them to sit. Once they sit calmly, then we re-engage. We can replay. I'm now asking them to go into a calm state. Um, but without giving them that alternative behavior, they're just going to go to what they know. And if you ignore an animal that has been reinforced, and this puppy has been reinforced to play, uh, then they will do what's sometimes called a uh, an extinction event where the behavior actually gets worse before it gets better. Um, really just kind of, you have to go through the course and stay the course with it and just be very, very on point with, uh, with the, uh, with that behavior. Uh, not a problem, Chris. And I hope that answers. If you have more questions regarding it, go ahead and put that, uh, into the chat and Miranda, I hope I answered that question with the 12 week old puppy. sounds like for the most part, you are on the right course. You might be having a timing issue. So just make sure you're very concise, very predictable. And you're and you're consistent. That's really a big factor. Very consistent, very fast, and you also mark it with yes or good and no for when they do the thing that you don't want, so that they know. Wait, I heard that noise again. Why? Oh, the th thing stopped right after that. What happened before that? They then they have to start thinking through the process. All right. Another question from Gretchen. Why does my cat like my boyfriend more than me? I feed him in shelter. Everybody acts like he exists. Uh, that one is an animal preference of cats. Uh, you actually, honestly, the best way to get an animal back towards you, uh, I find is actually doing kind of training exercises and going through all these routines. 
it's not always going to be perfect, uh, especially with uh, cats and certain uh, certain other animals where they just they're like, nope, this this one is the one. I like this one for whatever reason. Um, same thing happens at my house. Uh, Mary always uh, calls her cats traitors because she's had them since college, and they oftentimes would go to me <laughs> for the cuddles. But really, just actually working with them and going through the process, and actually just having treats, and if you're they can get cuddles and random treats from you, but not from him, then that would probably uh, lure them more towards uh, towards your end. All right, another question. Oh, we got a lot of people want a lot of questions tonight. That's fantastic. Uh, my female one year old pit bull chews on everything. Help give her toys, chew bones, tug ropes. My other pit doesn't chew things other than approved items. Okay. Well, so one-year-old, one-year-old definitely is still a puppy. Um, a lot of people have a misconception that for some odd reason, 12 months, magic, adult. That doesn't work that way with dogs. Usually between the age of two and three, depending on how big the breed is. Your pit bulls on the larger side, so it would be closer to the three than the two, uh, is when they're actually an adult, fully adult dog. Um, really at the one-year mark, you've got a uh, late teenager uh, kind of thing going on. So uh, they chew on everything. So um, with that situation, it, I, I, I do need a little bit more uh, information um, with regards to it. But um, if they're chewing on a lot of things, the really what I tend to do is I, I tend to teach. The first thing I teach almost every animal is target. Target training is when an animal learns to touch a body part to something. Um, in the zoo field, uh, we would have like little little wands with balls on it and then the animals would touch their paws or their nose to this little ball and that would be the that'd be the go-to uh situation for it uh so they go do that and uh this gives us a way to redirect them away from things that we don't want them to um it also help, helps us teach other things uh and a few other reasons why i start with that but basically i want a redirection so first i would teach your pup how to redirect using something like Target, uh, and then give them a appropriate toy and redirect them. And the thing is just redirecting, they'll go back to the thing that they weren't supposed to have. The other thing is I would, uh, once they learn that, okay, I can play with this without getting in trouble, that will work over time. The third thing uh, that I would have to ask though, there's a lot of variables when they start chewing on everything, is if the dog is kenneled when you're not around. Because when a puppy, I always suggest uh, that puppies are kenneled when you're not around because otherwise they learn bad behaviors. And when they learn those bad behaviors, um, they, it just becomes, it becomes ingrained in their head. And then you have to undo that learning. So if you kennel them when you're not there, they don't learn those bad behaviors and they only get re the reinforcement in the way that you want. So they learn good behaviors instead of the bad. Um, I hope that makes sense. Uh, but there's a few other variables because she's chewing on everything. I'm not sure if it's outdoor things or indoor things, or it's probably both in this situation. Uh, but the more an animal is not uh, not being uh, observed and taught what to do, the more they're going to self-learn. And if they once they chew on that item, they're going to be like, oh, I got reinforcement. I got an endorphin rush from doing that. I'm going to do it again. <laughs> and you're not there to help guide them uh, to a more appropriate thing. Uh, so that could be a situation. Uh, but really, it's a, it's just constant redirection and then giving them the appropriate thing. Um, so that way they don't learn that they like chewing, I don't know, the hoses in the backyard or something along those lines. Uh, the other factor, of course, is there's a bit of management involved. Um, which is harder with a, in a house with lots of toddlers or something like that, which is pick up all the things that you don't want destroyed so they don't uh, learn to get that endorphin rush. But that's, of course, easier said than in those environments. So we work a lot with the redirection. We work a lot with the kindling and uh, things like that. Not a problem. If you have any other questions, go ahead and put those into the chat. Um, so, uh, oh, truly recommend. Oh, thank you.
Okay, true. Okay, thank you very much for the uh, compliment, Gretchen. Uh, <laughs> I always work on truly, uh, truly trying to break down the communication barriers between families to make everybody uh, understand each other better and just get everybody working on the same page, uh, both the human side and the dog side. This is uh, uh, a lot because it's really a team effort in a family environment that we're trying to create. Uh, that said, I did already announce it once, but some people might be new. Uh, I am initiating a sale today, 25% um, off all training that is booked and paid for uh, by the 31st of December. So if you book it between now and the end of December, it will be 25% off. And I, uh, oh, I'll answer that question here in a second. So it'll be 25% off. Um, that also includes the travel fees. If you are outside of Garden, I do travel up to 150 mile radius. Uh, of the region, so I even go in dip into Colorado and Oklahoma on occasion. Uh, but if you, but yeah, so 25% off, and all you have to do is make sure that the invoice is paid for by the end of December to make sure that the the uh, the to make sure that the sessions are or yeah paid for by the end of December to make sure you lock in that discount. Then also that also works if you want to gift sessions to somebody else. That is totally valid. Uh, that's another reason why we're doing the sale because um, sometimes people plan for the puppy but not the lessons. And I did a study. Uh, I actually did research and found that I didn't do the study. Other people did the study that they found that the number one reason is that the sessions are or that uh, training is really the number one reason dogs and things get put sent back to the shelter. So that's my goal is to help prevent that and help all the people who do do the planning uh, with those situations. I am in, I got asked if I'm in garden. I am in garden. Um, the classes, uh, let's see here. Actually, let's, maybe it'll just be easier if I, uh, <laughs> how much are classes? It might be easier if I just find a, one of my flyers. And if I can post that up, that'd be great. So I'm going to take a look and do that and while, when I discuss the prices, let's see here, fuller type, yeah, let's see here, um, basic flyer, basic flyer, there you are, is this a new one, uh, no, no it is not, let's see here, ah, here we go, perfect, oh. Let's see. Well, looks like I need to put a new flyer out that has the uh, that has the pricing in, incorporated in it. But I'll just put this older flyer. It has my old name, Buckman Vicio Behaviors, because I do work with more than just uh, I do work with more than just um, dogs. I also work with uh, cats and. Uh, birds. I have a had a bird client that we worked together with. Let's see. Here we go. Let's zoom in here. Do, 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 do. All right. So, um, how much are classes? So, with the oh, I got a question there coming up here. Let's see. The pricing on the classes are as follows. I actually sell my uh, things in. Uh, And this, uh, the uh, the way I do packages, uh, I let people upgrade. So it's hard to predict, like, oh, how many sessions is it going to take? It's very hard to predict. We're dealing with brains. We're dealing with a very dynamic situation with the home environment, with the people involved, how much practice everybody has time to actually go through the exercises that we need to do to make the changes. Um, so I don't like to predict exactly. Generally, basic obedience is three to six sessions, usually somewhere in there. Aggression and anxiety issues tend to be six, ten, or more. And then if people want to do more advanced things, then it just goes on. If we do more than ten sessions together, then after that it's 60 a session. But I let people upgrade through the packages. So you can start with one, then pay the difference, 
to get the next two to go to the three package, then pay the difference to get the next three to go to the uh, six package. But uh, to get the sale, you have anything that we you want the sale on needs to have uh, yeah, need, the, needs to have the uh, the invoice paid by the end of December. But aside from that, let's see. <laughs> okay, so let's see. I got thank you, Sean, for the recommendation. Also, let's see, Micah. Uh, is it, is it is it safe for cats to eat raw pumpkin? My seven month old kitten loves it, uh, but I have read conflicting stories so as to whether it's safe or not. Um, yeah, I'm not really a dietitian. Generally, I would say no. I don't think pumpkin is gonna like do anything major. Uh, I don't believe the squashes. I haven't heard of anything where the squashes were toxic to cats or dogs. Generally, cats are strict carnivores. Dogs are actually omnivores. They actually eat meat and plants, um, which is why the their diets are both are a bit of mix. Uh, cat diets are strict uh, protein. That said, sometimes you can mix in uh, plant material into cat food just for fiber issues. Um, generally, as long as the kitten doesn't eat too much, it probably isn't going to be that bad. Um, I would... Avoid it as much as possible. It's not unheard of for a cat, a kitten, or a cat to chew on plants. A lot of people with cats cannot be plant painful because of that. They just they like whatever sensation that they're getting out of it, either from the chewing aspect or maybe there is a weird flavor in that plant, such as catnip that they go crazy for, or a chemical situation. Um, I would just try to avoid it, but if the cat got into it i wouldn't i wouldn't be rushing them to the vet myself i would be probably pretty okay i just keep an eye on it if i saw something then i would take them to the vet but generally the squashes i have not heard of much bad stuff now there's a number of other house plants i would watch for the toxicity of uh so if i had a random house plant that i didn't identify then i'd be more worried than a pumpkin um on those scenarios just because of toxicity uh Okay, uh, next question. How do you get them to drop what they are chewing on? It turns into a game of tug and war when he grabs our clothing or anything that's not a toy. Also, what about growling, snarling around people? Food wrappers. We have 10-week-old puppy. Ah, okay. This is a very common issue. And the simplest answer to that is trade. Find something else that the pup wants. Trade for it. Usually, this is a higher-value food. Um, uh the, uh, the higher value food is um, usually, uh, usually I do like a grilled, like a skinless grilled chicken type thing for a very high end, or just oftentimes a treat that they just don't normally get, a dog treat of some sort, uh, but you trade for it. Um, as soon as they drop it, and with clicker training, we would mark the moment they drop it so they know that that's what's getting them the treat, and then they realize that that's what it is. If you trade for it, if you try to fight for it, it will turn into a tug of war thing, and then they will growl because that's the way that they communicate that they're they're no, I don't I don't want to do that. That's it's just them communicating back with you. It's also a warning that they are getting, going to be upset uh, if you just take the thing. So if you trade for it, a couple things will happen. A, they now have a positive association with giving you things instead of just a negative one. B, uh, they will actually sometimes start bringing the things to you which is great because if if you trade for things they might go grab the thing but if you if you just try to steal it from them then they're going to go hide it and they're going to take it away and they're going to chew on it without you being able to observe it and they're going to um, really uh, they're going to uh, uh, just destroy whatever it is without you even knowing until it's too late if you trade with them they will bring it to you because they will be expecting a reward. And you should reward them for bringing you the thing because now you have the thing in your hand and it's not underneath the bed or in their kennel just being decimated. Um, so if you do a trade, A, they become happier about giving you stuff, and B, 
they won't run off with it. They'll actually come to you with it more often than not. Like, hey, I found this thing. Is this worth anything? <laughs> kind of deal. And um, although I have, you do run into the uh, the only issue with uh, doing the trade and then bringing the, the things to you is that they uh, then might bring some other items because oftentimes they like to go into the laundry. And you might have guests over and they suddenly bring in something that they found. <laughs> but at least it's not hidden and destroyed once again. Um, so yes, trade is the best thing to do with, a, especially with a puppy that you're just trying to get them to understand that you just want this thing and it's not that big a deal. All right. So next question. And what age, uh, do I recommend getting puppies training? Um, well, uh, the age that I recommend getting a puppies trained, honestly, is right off the bat. You can't start too early, especially if you utilize a positive reinforcement training. The more traditional aversive style trainings, they would say something, because I used to do that, it would be like nine to 12 months of age, maybe six for the early stuff. But because of the aversive, you could potentially cause problems. With the positive reinforcement training, you can actually start right off the bat. I've heard of some people actually starting the training process because they were trainers and they had the mom who gave birth and they literally started the training within the week. Um, obviously you're not doing like sit or things at that level, but you're getting the puppy used to the idea of the clicker and the used to the idea of the stuff. But basically sooner is always better. They actually say, when we say that puppies need socializing, the, the optimal window is between the age of two and four months of age. Uh, anything after that, it doesn't mean it's worthless or wasted but you've missed the optimal time. So sooner is always better uh, than later because also you can nip those, uh, those bad behaviors before they even start. Because if you get them too late and they've already started, then now you have to work on regressing uh, and then working forward. That's why I always like to tell, I always tell people, I'm like, uh, when they ask that question, uh, I'm like, uh, sooner is always cheaper. <laughs> you, you're gonna need more sessions later on if you wait until it's an already a bad habit because now we have to undo the bad habit before we can really get the new stuff in. Uh, so sooner is always better. If you're using a positive reinforcement, which is what I utilize, you can start pretty much as soon as you get the puppy and then work on. Now with puppies, I do slow down the training a little bit. So an adult dog, we might be meeting every week to two weeks in between sessions. Uh, with a puppy, the first couple might be close together just to make sure we're on the right page. Oh, Nemeris popping into the <laughs> little V, the little uh, thing that's kind of cute. Um, the uh, so the uh, where was I? So with puppies, sometimes I do space out that time in between sessions a little bit longer, just so we can hit more developmental times. As long as we're not running into issues uh, along the way, like some maybe an aggression issue or an anxiety issue uh, popped up that we didn't have planned for, we might stay closer together. But for the most part, we might, we'll, with puppies, I generally space it out and so we can hit more of their developmental times. Okay, another question. Okay, what if the dogs do bad things when you are gone? Like dig through the trash, for example. Is there any way that you can trade that behavior? Uh, not really, because the, so, the timing association with the issue is uh, it doesn't, you, you, you can't catch the behavior and whatever punishment you're giving them is not being associated with the behavior of the trash. They just know you came home and you're angry. The chances of them actually creating a link between that and the other, not as much. They will, a lot of people mistake what they call appeasement behaviors where they do the, the puppy dog eyes. But any, I bet you, uh, actually they did studies, so I know 100% of the time. If you make that tone of voice of anger, they make that face. It's That face is more associated with them being upset or you being upset than uh, the other. Um, which actually goes into the next question. Do I recommend kennel training to, uh, animals? Yes, yes, yes. When animals, it's just like a child, if they're allowed to just go willy-nilly, then they will learn bad habit, bad, be, blah, blah, bad habits and bad behaviors. You have to monitor them during their whole learning process. Otherwise, we, we're going to run into issues, which is why I do recommend kenneling. Can a lot of dogs reach a point where they're not kenneled when you're not home? Yes. 
Now, with the trash situation, even mine, I remember one time particularly, I was on the board for the Humane Society at the time, and I came home from the meeting, house was destroyed, I was like, well, this is ironic. But it was because we left the trash out, and there was like a piece of meat at the bottom of the trash. That is a high-end um, value that they're not going to be able to uh, resist without me there. So, which is why we put the trash in a behind a door, some type of door uh, in which we put a child lock because our dogs know how to open cabinet doors. So we have to put one of those little child safety things. But that would, that's part of management. So with the trash, uh, it's basically a combination of management and kennel training. Uh, if they're adults, then they can go away without being kenneled sometimes uh, if they can resist most temptations. Um, but I do recommend kennel training because so especially early on so that they don't get that bad behavior plus at some point in time the dog is going to need to be in a kennel and the more you emotionally prepare them for that uh the better that the the uh the better they'll do uh let's see and uh provide help with that any one of my pups choose through every single kennel okay yes we can with those situations um usually what it is is some type of separation anxiety so the one of the bet one of the things we can do is take advantage of modern technology. Um, I like those things like the furbos and those automatic pet feeders. We just need to make sure that it's a consistent situation to create a positive feedback. And we also have to desensitize the pup to being alone. So actually, I do have a lot of uh, practices and things, and I also do suggest people slowly integrate their pup as much as possible. One thing that we're running into especially in 2020, is we're calling them COVID puppies. People got puppies, and then they got to stay home from work for three months, and then they go back to work for eight hours, and the puppies never really experienced the emotional having to just be alone for eight hours, so they're not resilient enough to handle what is, what's happening. So, so yeah, so we, we need to work the pup up. So you, I had some teachers that they knew that when they were going back to school, they got them in the summer, I would like have them do exercises like, okay, no, now the pup needs to be kenneled, whether you're home or not for X amount of time, because eventually they're gonna hit a point where you're gone for four to eight hours and they need to be able to handle what's gonna happen. So uh, it would be that the, those automatic feeders are great because then they at least give some type of reinforcement for being calm in the kennel and there's and they can start to enjoy it so yes i can i can help with the uh, kennel situation um <laughs> and discussions in the comment all right uh well if anybody has any other questions go ahead and put those in the chat i'd be happy to answer them now the um i once again will say we are doing that 25 percent off sale from now until the end of the year. Uh, so basically any invoices that we get for uh, training sessions will be 25% off. Uh, the sessions are uh, 100, actually I'll try to drop those into the chat here. Actually you have a, I, I got a thing for that. Um, I'll drop the pricing into the chat as well uh, for this, uh, for our sessions. But remember they are 25% off so long as the invoice is paid by December 31st, uh, then you keep the uh, discount. Um, and you can also gift that to other people. So if you want to give uh, a gift of three sessions to somebody, that would be 25% off. And just let me know who you're giving it to, and we can uh, get them in the books, and I will see about getting in contact with those individuals if I don't hear back from them. Uh, let's see here. So the pricing is... For one session, it's 100. This is before the discount. Uh, it's 100 for for th uh, three sessions. It's 250 for six. It's 425 for 10. It is 600. And anything after 10 is uh, anything after 10 is um, 60 dollars a session. Basically, it gets cheaper per session the longer we do session these together. So. Um, yeah, go ahead and get in, in with that deal. If anybody has any other questions, uh, let me know, and I'll be happy to answer those. I do travel up to 150 miles away. There is a travel fee 
if we're outside of Garden City or Holcomb. Um, and it's basically it's pretty easy. If you live in Scott, you can just go on Google, say what's the distance between Garden City and Scott, and that's the and I just charge a dollar a mile based on that, just to keep it easy. So you can kind of predict uh, what it is. I go out to Liberal on occasion. I've actually go to uh, go to Oklahoma and Colorado, um, uh, working with these situations. I hope that answered your question, uh, Haley. Uh, if you have any other questions, let me know. And I'd be happy to. Uh, how much time should you spend training a puppy every day? Oh, that's a, I love this question because a lot of people, uh, it's it's kind of a lot of people overdo it. How much time uh, should you spend training a puppy every day? We are also trying to homeschool, and it gets exhausting. Is it okay to kennel the puppy when he's being bad or acting out? I do not like to use the kennel, and I'm going to address that last one, then go to the first one. I do not like using the kennel as a punishment because you need that kennel as a tool. And if it is a punishment, then eventually the dog will not want to go. Um, a lot of times I work with large breed dogs, and if they eventually don't want to go, if they they will find ways. I've had, even in my own household, um, I have a, a Dane La, a Doberman Great Dane mix, and he figured out that my wife wasn't able to put him in the kennel if he just flipped on his back and flailed his legs up, like basically throwing a tantrum because she just could not physically carry him or do anything like that. So I, I, I would not use that as a punishment. But what I would do with the homeschooling is train the puppy to uh, train the puppy to go into the kennel and just enjoy being in the kennel, possibly treat period periodically dropped in the while they're in the kennel for an hour to two hours at a time during the day. And then that would make your life a little easier because then the pup's contained but it's going to take some training. I would start with smaller amounts of time, like 15, 10, 5 minutes, to 10 minutes, 30 minutes, get up to an hour, then up to two hours, and just make that as part of the, the process. And then the puppy stays in there. You can do what you need to do, and then let the puppy back out, and then um, periodically. But this is a very normal situation. Dogs go through this all the time. They sleep like 14 hours a day. All you're doing is setting them when those nap times are. It's just like a child, honestly, a very small child when you're trying to get them uh, on a schedule. So uh, I would just use, I would try not to use the kennel as a punishment, just use the kennel as a uh, tool to, uh, but we have to get them uh, emotionally resilient to it. Now, how long should you pay, train the puppy every day? Especially a puppy. At best, a dog has about the mental equivalency of a three or four year old. Some dogs for some behaviors can Extend that time and go long times on a task because they become obsessed with it. Um, but most of the time, they have about the attention span of a toddler. So I would not train for more than 15 minutes during a session. Usually I tell people, especially with baby puppies, go for five minutes, just five to 15 minutes. Go for a five-minute training session. Do a few things. Get the puppy interested. Get the puppy used to doing, being asked to do things and doing things. And then break it up. Maybe go do a play thing or something else. I, I usually tell people train at least once a day. But if you can do two or three, then it's going to go that much faster. But no one session should ever be longer than five to 15 minutes. Um, a lot of people, uh, I come and I do an hour-long session, but that's because I'm also working with the people and the dogs, and we're going back and forth. Um, so that I'm not literally just at the dog for one hour straight. Do this, do that. Uh, anything past that five, that fifteen minute mark, you're going in one ear and it's going out the other. It, it'd be like asking um, asking a uh, first or second grader to do math for an hour and a half. They don't do that in schools because they know that they only have thirty minutes of attention span before the brain goes, okay, we are done with this. It's I can't anymore. Especially with baby puppies that are learning, you're definitely going to run into that. Um, <laughs> Gretchen just uh, agreeing. Yeah, we worked on uh, some some things uh, with that, and it, it's all about reinforcement. So, what the process that I use it uses a thing from um, it uses uh, basically it's a thing in psychology called operant conditioning. Um, it's and I, I take from the school of or take from what's known as animal behavior analysis and apply it. Um, which is very closely related to applied behavior analysis, 
They're both ABAs, um, which is the only difference is one's used on humans and one's used on animals. You just adjust them differently. Uh, but it, when you do things consistently and you set when and the when and how the rewards are do, happening, it can go a long way with uh, changing those types of behaviors. Uh, with I believe you said you're the Angela was the one who said that she had the ten week old puppy, something like that, and that is uh, that is very tough because you have a baby baby uh, uh, that you're dealing with. Um, let's see where was it? Yeah, ten week old. Yep. So you got a ten week old. You have a baby baby, and uh, depending on which breed size their puppies until they're up to two or three years or yeah two or three years of age. Um, the teenage phase usually starts between nine and twelve months of age, and then you got the late teens for the from twelve to twenty-four months of age, depending on the breed. If it's a smaller breed, they tend to mature a little faster than the larger breeds. Uh, um, but I hope that answered your uh, your question. Um, but really, it just comes down to being very concise on how you reward, and it, the treats aren't the only reward. We also do. Uh, <clears throat> We also do uh, attention, and we also use toys, really, but it's always the animal that decides what is reinforcing and what we can train with, because um, just like people, we have they have different drives, so we have to use their drives to work with them. All right. If anybody has any last questions, we have about, uh, looks like three or four minutes left. Um, I was a few minutes late, so I don't mind going over. Actually, I never mind going over. Um, so just let me know and throw those into the chat. Uh, once again, we are doing a 25% off sale uh, from now until the end of the year. So anything that is booked and paid for by December 31st will have 25% off taken off the training um, for our training uh, sessions. Um, so... Uh, and one of the reasons I do that is just to help keep pet pups in homes. And we do have a, there are a lot of uh, animals that end up in homes during the holidays, which don't feel guilty about because there is a myth that uh, the, uh, no, oh, not a problem, I hope. And if you have any questions, go ahead and uh, put them in the chat. I do this every fourth Wednesday uh, of the month. So every fourth Wednesday at eight o'clock, I will be on and happy to answer any of these questions. Um, and I also, and I've also got 13 years in the zoo field, plus college and all the other time. So if you have any, really any, even wildlife questions, I'm happy to answer when I can. Um, uh, my knowledge base with animals is kind of broad <laughs> when it comes to behaviors and things of that nature. Uh, so yeah, so we were doing the, I, as I said, uh, I did research a few years back, found out that the the holiday puppy return rate was actually a myth. When they actually did studies and found out why puppies and when puppies were being returned, uh, there was no correlation with that. Really, the impromptu uh, puppies are more likely to come back home, but really the number one correlation between a dog going back into the shelter is lack of training and lack of understanding from the people. So that's where I come in. I try to make sure everybody's communicating on the same level and uh, keep it, keep uh, keeping those pups at home. So... Uh, yeah, anything. And if you want to gift these sessions to somebody, maybe you know somebody who is getting a puppy, um, I'd be happy to work with you on that and getting that set up as well. But And everything's 25% off. They <laughs> keep relationships from failing. <laughs> well, dogs, well, I mean, there's a reason there's a show called It's Me or the Dog. <laughs> it, it, these can be stresses in any family environment. <laughs> so I try to make sure everybody can stay in the home as long as possible. Excellent. All right, let me know if anybody has any questions and throw them in the chat. I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, if you want to, uh, you can uh, we'll post another thing about this. Uh, I'm trying out new technology, so bear with me uh, with that. Um, but we should be doing this every fourth Wednesday at 8 p.m. And actually, I don't know if I see on the calendar. When is the next one? Do, do, do. When is the next one? Next one actually is pretty close to Christmas. Usually is. Uh, 
So let's see. It should be one, two, three. Yeah, it's the 23rd. So it's the eve of Christmas Eve would be the next one. So the 23rd should be the uh, next uh, AMA. And if anybody needs to get a hold of me, you can uh, contact me at bbbehaviors.com. That is my website. You can also um, email me at witbuckman at bbbehaviors.com. Or you can call me at 620-805-9429. And any of those, there should be a... Uh, there should be on the website, there should be a way to just book a session and uh, you just pick a, pick a date and time that's available and we will work. I do this from 10 a.m. until uh, 10 p.m. seven days a week. So just trying to work with people's schedules to get the, get everybody working on the same page. And if anybody has any last questions, go ahead and throw them in the chat and I'll be on for about two more minutes. But I do hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving and uh, the upcoming holidays. And everybody stay nice and safe out there. Uh, we know we have the turkey already uh, already uh, getting prepped and everything for tomorrow. So just remember, as I said at the beginning, that there, there's not, I wouldn't feed too many scraps from the table because it's uh, there's a lot of different variations. Some things are toxic to animals and some aren't. Uh, some things are higher in fat content uh, than we generally like. Uh, some and uh, things of that. And thank you. And happy holidays to you as well. All right. Well, you guys have a great holiday, and I'm thank you all for coming and visiting with me. If anybody has any questions once this is over, feel free to message me through Facebook. You can text me at the phone number that I put in the, the chat or email me. I'm pretty much available on any method that you'd like to uh, contact me. Phone, email, uh, website, any of those will work. You guys have a great day.